Okay, so in the last video we produced uh, the landscape for our ball. In this video we're going to make it move. Now I would recommend that you try and type in this code as you go along just to make sure you really understand what's going on here. It's very easy to watch and think you understand it until you have to type it in. Okay, so let's make the ball move. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to need to give it a velocity. So let's add to its properties. At the moment, the ball has properties of position, pos, radius, and color. And we can add as many different properties as we like. Let's have one called vel, which is going to be where we store our velocity. So velocity is a vector as well. And let's start off by having it going sideways at a speed of 1. So that'll be, say, an x, naught, and naught in the y and z. Now, you'll see that the vel here has not gone blue. Position, radius, and color are defined as properties of ball. Velocity is not. We're just giving it, we can always give it an extra property. So we call it anything we like. We call it zog or banana or whatever it might be. And it's just a space in the memory to store a vector. We're calling it vel for velocity because we're actually going to use it as velocity, but the computer doesn't know that. That's entirely up to us. Okay, so now if we run things, it makes no difference. It's not giving in error messages, but nothing's moving. To make it move, we're going to have to have some time steps. And the way we do that is with a loop. So, move the ball, that's another comment. Now we need to pick our starting time. I'm going to start at time equals zero, I'm going to call time t. And we're going to have to move in time steps. So this is a numerical model. What we're going to do is we're going to advance the time step by step by step, and each step work out where it's going for the next little time. This is normally called dt for the length of the time step, and you want it to be pretty short. Short enough that the forces don't really change very much during that time step. So I'm going to pick, I don't know, 0.01 seconds. Because if you throw a ball, things typically happen on time scales of a few seconds. So we want a time scale, a time step that's much smaller than that, like 100 times smaller or something. So 0.01 sounds about right. We'll experiment later and see if it really is small enough. And now we start up a loop. Now we're going to use a while command. And we're going to do while, let's pick some time limit, while time's less than one second. And a colon. So what that means is everything in the loop will be done until time is no longer less than one second. So until this condition here is no longer met. And things inside the loop are indented. First thing we need is to update the time. So time equals time plus dt. And that will increment the time. If you didn't have that, the time would just stay zero and this loop will run forever. And you'd be wondering why the computer is going forever. And getting very hot. OK. Um, what I'm going to do now is just check that's working by having a print statement print t. So, so far the loop doesn't do anything apart from make the time go up in time steps, but I just want to check that works. It's always good to check every little bit um, so you can avoid bugs rather than write a huge bit of code and then discover 15 errors all at once. Okay, so let's try running this and see what happens. Okay, so it gave us our landscape, nothing moving, and if we scroll through here we can see whole string of numbers that so went 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all the way up to 1. So what's happening is time starts off at 0, then it gets to the loop, and everything inside the loop, which means the things that are indented, which means they have these spaces in front of them, will be done repeatedly until this condition is no longer met. So what it will do is it'll take the time value, 0, and add dt, 0 0.01, to it. So t will now be 0 0.01, then it will print that, then it goes back to the while statement, 
The condition is still met, t is still less than 1, so he'll then do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until eventually t gets large enough that it's no longer less than 1, in which case it stops. And that's what happens rather quickly. OK. What happens if you move the print statement down here? Now what's happening is if you put the print statement down there, it's no longer in the loop. Only the things that are indented, which means they've got all this white space in front, are inside the loop. It's important they all be indented by the same amount, otherwise Python will get confused. Um, also, for example, normally it'll do it automatically for you. When you've got a while statement, you just hit enter. It's, it'll um, s automatically indent things the right amount. You then have to hit delete to go away. So what will it do now? Let's find out. Now it just prints one. It didn't print a whole string of numbers. The reason it's done that is because the print statement is no longer in the loop. So what happens is it goes around this loop, making t all the way big, and then once the loop is finished, it then just prints t once. We could do something like print and see what happens. So what it will have done is printed still in loop a hundred times and then one at the end. So that's just something to be careful about. If the things are indented, they're in the loop and they get done lots and lots of times. If they are not indented, they are not in the loop and they won't get done lots of times. Very common programming mistake is to lose track of what is and is not in the loop. OK. Now there's another command we're going to want in the loop, which is uh, rate. What this means is the computer will do everything in the loop as fast as it can, but when we're actually going to do graphics like move a ball around, we don't want it to try and run too fast because that could thrash the computer and make it get really hot. So this limits the rate at which the computer will do it to, say, do everything in the loop 50 times a second. You can give any value you like here, but if you make it too high and it's a big complicated loop, then the computer might not be able to do it that fast. But rate of 50 sounds reasonable. OK, now we actually need to move the ball. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to need to change its position. Now, we know its velocity. At the moment, I'm just going to let it move in a straight line. I'm not going to worry about gravity or drag or anything. So, as always, start off simple and add complexity. Don't try and go for perfection right away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, let's say an object is at this position at the start of a time step. Where is it going to be at the end of a time step? So if you're four meters along and going at one meter per second and your time step is two seconds, you get your starting position four plus the velocity times the time step, which is one times two. In mathematical format, what that means, we're going to say ball dot pause equals ball dot pos plus ball dot fell times dt. So as always for these sort of equals commands in a program language, what it does is look up ball dot pos means the position of the object called ball. So it's the position of our sphere. Likewise ball dot vel will tell you the velocity of the ball and ball dot radius will tell you the radius of the ball and so on. Ball dot color will tell you its color. So ball.pos is going to be the current position, and then we're adding to it the current velocity times the time step. So if it was going at 1 meter per second, time step is 0 0.01, so it'll travel 0 0.01. This is a vector, so it'll be in the that direction. So once it's added those together, it'll then update ball.pos. So it calculates whatever's in the right using the current value and feeds it into whatever's in the left of the equal side, thus updating it. OK, let's see if this works. OK, is that what you were expecting? So it moved for one second and then it stopped. Now we can double check what's happening by using a print command. So you can print ball.pos to see what's happening and make sure it's what we think is happening. So what we can see is that uh, it starts off 
4.99 and 4.98, so the x value is steadily increasing as it moves to the right, the y and z values are remaining the same, which is what we expect. That was for time less than one second, if we make it less than three seconds, and maybe we get rid of the print command. Okay, so it's now stopped after three seconds. It's usually worth, when you write a program for the first time, make that time short, so you don't have to wait too long until you discover you've made some horrible computer bug in it. But this all seems to be working. If we wanted to know where it was at the end of three seconds, we can put a statement down here, print dot pause, and because it's not in the loop, because it's not indented, it'll only print it once when the loop is finished. I hope. Let's see if that works. So it's moving, it's moving, and then after three seconds it should stop. Okay. Now you notice it wasn't actually three seconds. Um, all that means is it's when time is less than three, and it's hopefully doing this at 50 loops a second, 0 0.01. So that probably means it's going to take about six seconds. Because it's doing 50 loops a second, each loop in the model is 0 0.01 seconds. So that means you're going 0.01 times 50, so that's about half a second in every second. If we made the rate is 100, then it should go twice as fast, and what in our model is supposed to take 3 seconds will actually take 3 seconds, assuming the computer can do it that fast. Let's try it. 1, 2, 3. Yeah, that sounds about right. So we've now got a model where the model time is actually the same as the real time of us viewing it. Not necessarily very important, but sometimes it's nice, especially if you're doing your computer graphics or something. You'd want the people to be moving at about plausible rates. Okay, so we now have a moving object. Hooray!